in this, this period of time when yeah. you're here, and then we'll come back to more specific in-depth subjects. Uh, mm -hmm. There are a couple of things that came up yesterday that seemed to me uh, critical to uh, discuss a little more in detail, and Ron and I were just agreeing that he had the same questions that I yeah. did, basically, right. so that maybe we could... <coughs> If I could read you a couple of sentences from yesterday's discussion that I noted down with, with uh, notations that perhaps we could ask more about those things, then that might give you an idea of the range. Yeah. I think it all has to do with, in some ways, the differences between semantic net conceptions of conversation and, and your conception. Um, let me just read you these, these comments without elaborating. I thought one of the, the issues going from back to front that needed expanding was a statement, if I got it quite, I'm not sure it's quite accurate, but I think the gist is here. Yeah. Uh, the unfoldment is the dual of the mesh. Yeah. The passive representation of an active process can be represented as an unfoldment which reveals the active process. This is unique feature of L sub P, which derives from its definition as a concept of agreement, coherence. That's uh, the language uh, of. Uh, and from its uh, definition of concept, of, concept, of yes. agreement, and of. Oh, co uh, concept, comma, agreement, and, and yeah, coherence. Okay, very good. I good. think. Agreement or coherence? Uh, well, coherence is a model of agreement. Right. And distinction. So that that's one of the things. <coughs> the other ones on the table mm -hmm. and then you can Good. play with them as you like. Another section that I thought deserved L P dual curve of concept oh, right. specification this mm -hmm. whole nature of passive and active uh, properties. Mm -hmm relates us very much to the issue that Heinz originally injected as a, as a goal he would like to see us pursue, to look towards language, it seems to me, that, mm -hmm. that uh, we're now beginning to deal with uh, features that are embedded in <coughs> the language we use in natural language conversation yeah. that are difficult to, uh, that tend to obscure certain kinds of understanding. Yeah. But I'm particularly interested in that quote and your concept about the, the fact that this feature of L sub P, that you have the ability to reveal the active element in a passive representation easily, mm -hmm. uh, that this derives from the definitions. That's the part of that quote that I thought, that it derives from the definition of concept of agreement. Well, and right, okay, we just have to go over that. Yes, I must say that yesterday I was struck by that quote as well, and I couldn't, I, I couldn't make heads or tails of it. Well, we need to go over that and develop it. Okay, that's... that's Besides to what we do I, need to do. Well, let me just read you the two other items that yeah, I know. Yeah, sure, I'm telling you, you know, no, that's all right, we get to them all right. I mean, but it's just, you, you carry on reading them, please, and then I'll just put them down as notes, and then I'll have them in front of me, and can, can okay. put them down, it matters to be dealt with in some order, one right. order or another. Right. Now, the other thing I thought really worth elaborating was, you, you had a small aside there, which is somewhat on tape, and I couldn't write down too much of it because I was listening too hard, about Ashby's criticism of the expert systems. Um, in which you Ashby's talked about criticism, or was it Ashby's definition of the machine? Well, where you talked about a string of knots, or a loop tied back to itself, yes. uh, that has an algebra implying seriality okay, and Ashby temporality. Machine. Yeah. Ashby machine, yeah. Yes, uh, in other words, it would have been a criticism of expert systems had the term been in vogue in those days. That's right. As indeed it was of computers, excepting it. So, string knot. And this whole concept that uh, the entailment mesh, in the way it unfolds, does not have the same restrictions, but allows concurrency, generalization, analogy, and so on. So again, we're really talking about the distinctions between uh, the semantic net approach and the entailment yeah. uh, mesh. And then the third is really just the same taken from another track. 
I thought that when you did do a formal comparison of conversation theory and semantic nets, or the entailment mesh and semantic nets, uh, you got down essentially as I could follow that, which was a little bit rich with digressions too, uh, that there were three basic points you were bringing up. One was the underlying logic, if I could use just the contractions yes. of coherence, distinction, and process yes. versus the truth value logic. The second one was the issue of what is meant by knowledge mm. in the two different systems. And the third one seemed to be... So, uh, truth value, coherence, well, truth value, uh, just, well, I just... I just put down here, true truth value. Right. The uh, second one actually was uh, that the concept that each expert occupies a different world. Experts in universes as a world. And the third one was the uh, the what is the differences in what is meant by knowledge. Yeah. Knowledge, belief, shall I put down here? Knowledge, belief. Yes. Shall I put down here as, okay. a, as a keynote? Right. Now there were there were really I think no point four that emerged on in that particular discussion, although you might have some. You elaborated quite at length on point three and rather richly, so that. Maybe we want to go back over those three three items. Well, may, I, may I read the points I've got down here so that I'm sure that they are um, properly listed? Mm -hmm. um, the notion of uh, a dual uh, representation in L sub P and processes, uh, their improvements. Mm -hmm. Um, this arises uh, because of the specification of concept in conversation theory, and uh, in particular because the logic of the specification of concept first, and then it also arises because it's a, uh, a language of coherence. Um, distinction and process, um, and this gives it certain you know, L sub P certain unique features as a very primitive but nevertheless manipulable language, uh, which is not unlike a natural language and does not in a sense to lose the, the salient features of a natural language. Okay. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, Ashby's notion of a machine as a memorable for transformation bits in reverse onto a string with knots in it or a clock. And then being a simple way of talking about the algebraic constraints of a machine. In fact, a very nice way because <coughs> although it doesn't. Uh, it doesn't specify what kind of, of computing machine it is. It, it is a fundamental architectural feature of all computing machines. And, uh, can, you say, can you say that again, what his notion is? His notion uh, is simply that, that if, I, uh, if I have a thing called a computing machine, it will carry out uh, certain transformations, which I might represent by T. Um, it does this in a certain order, which is a string and knot type of order, uh, and has topological dimension of either, either zero or one, whichever you like to put it. It's nothing to do with well, nothing to do with it. It's very remotely connected with Euclidean dimension. Um, it is a, a number like Euclidean dimension, but does not have the same meaning. Um, the <coughs> Next thing is that uh, if it has a richer meaning, it encompasses that meaning. Uh, and uh, then mapped back onto the same thing by the inverse transformation. By the what? By the inverse transformation. So if we call the transformation T, and let's say Rho or something, the clock and instance, uh, what a machine is, is T Rho T to the minus one. Mm -hmm. Okay, and uh, that's what it is. 
and um, that architecture prevails, even though there may be many ongoing, but if they interact with preordained or predetermined interaction called synchronization fixed in the architecture for interrupt, etc., uh, features, then it, it won't too much matter. Uh, it's still true of machine. That is the point you're getting at, I think, yeah. Uh, the, um, the semantic net. Oh, she has it's almost impossible. Uh, the semantic net, another net, and the meshes. Um, semantic net or other net and meshes uh, are requiring comparison and um, maybe in various ways compared and contrasted. In other words, uh, mesh is, is not in fact, although well, it looks quite like a semantic net. Uh, there are many kinds of semantic nets, so it's very difficult to say it ain't a semantic net, but I don't know what a semantic net is to begin with. I mean, it seems an absurd title to give to right. well, that's uh, a collection of things which, uh, why, why, why in the world it's called such a thing, I don't know, but um, I think it's a misuse of the word semantic. Maybe we need to have a and, definition uh, from you on what would be required. Well, I don't know, I, I, I think Godard and things are just careless pieces of hodgepodge or But what would you require to, to uh, call something? Well, I want so LSOP, uh, or an equi it's equivalent, something no. as, as rigorous as that, and I don't... Uh, are I don't they each trying to do something very different? They are, but the trouble is that they don't really uh, represent any language, as far as I know. I may be wrong, but I mean, for example, you can say there are frame-based nets, and there are nets based upon associative connections other than frames. Um, this is saying very little about the linguistics of the thing at all. It's saying a good deal about how it's implemented in the machine. And, um, in fact, I don't quite know why people call these things semantic nets, and this is not just a joke or a snide remark or something. It seems a curious usage. And I think the only reason they do is because things with some sort of meaning to people are usually stuck in them. Uh, at nodes, uh, and occasionally between nodes, and so far as relations are attached to these things. I don't see what it is in the net that makes it semantic, or rather than uh, a net. Uh, Gordon, could you give us a... Uh, <laughs> I, I recently looked up in, a, in the, the big Webster's Third International the word semantic, and uh, several other words, syntactic, and a whole yeah. range of words, just to see, again, what the, the well, classical I, definitions I, I are. Guess They're I very, very in, they're not very adequate definitions in, in those books because they all are using the other ones to define something that it's clear there's not a, a good formal meaning for. So when you're throwing the word semantic around here, well, yeah. uh, I'm, I'm curious used to, how, do you, how do you mean that? I used in the sense of Lady Lovelace that uh, semiotic uh, is divisible rather arbitrarily actually into the following part, syntax semantics and pragmatics. The syntax is concerned with vocabulary and the rules for making expressions of the elements of this vocabulary about things, and possibly for inferring, uh, regardless, because it's perfectly possible that the symbols in question might be uninterpreted and you would get analytic truths. Uh, it's also true that as soon as you interpret the symbolism, you give it a semantic uh, and the semantic is, if you like, a meaning attached to it, or it's an interpretation attached to it, and it may either be in one or, as in the next issue brought up, in many different universes of discourse. Uh, and now, in order to use the language, one has to inquire why is the language used, for what purpose, by whom, to whom, which is pragmatics. I'm using semantics as uh, the central component in that otherwise rather arbitrary definition, sorry, arbitrary division of things. Uh, arbitrary because, in fact, it looks clear cut and to end in some context, maybe. But 
In fact, one is referring to rather convenient categories rather than hard ones. Yeah. Uh, there is an overlap between them all. I mean, you can ask, okay. you've been pre pressed and asked what is an uninterpreted symbol. Mm -hmm. I find that very hard. To uh, what, wh why, why is that string written? Well, it is the common one, and uh, it's, um, or I, I mean, I've given several to make them into one of the common ones. I mean, some folks would insist that semantics is an interpretation in a particular universe. Interpretation with respect to truth valuation schemes in a universe, or in several universes. Or, well, you know, different sorts of criteria might be laid down. The difficulty is that when you remove any of them, it becomes a bit uh, questionable why anybody would want to make any utterance at all, or what the utterance would be, or writing would be, as the case may be. And um, I don't know whether that tallies with your notion of semantics. It's as good as, as any. Yeah. Um, I, I tend to think that it's the problem that I, I, my own view in the matter is really that um, you have a semiotic and it may be very convenient to divide it into semantical components and pur purposeful, pragmatical, directed components and uh, addressing particular people or particular groups or listening to them or whatever or trying to persuade them to achieve some specification or other. Uh, between world or worlds or universe, universe is a discourse in which you're speaking and into the rules of grammar and the, the symbols of the, of the alphabet which render something interpretable to somebody. But actually, when you dissect these things out there, they are, I think, somewhat interdependent. And I'm not saying it isn't a, it isn't a useful distinction. I think it is, I think it, but uh, I don't actually know any system that is not if properly regarded and critically regarded, it's going to turn out to have a full semiotic in it. I mean, I'd be doubtful of things like purposeless to nobody utterances by nobody, to purely uninterpreted symbols you're written in strings by some agent, uh, which is presumably, I don't know what. Uh, and, uh, by, um, for that matter, interpretations of nothing. <laughs> I mean, it, it is very difficult uh, to conceive when you actually look at it and uh, look at the dissection and examine the components of it. I think that the division becomes blurred, hazy. Uh, I call that <laughs> And uh, this doesn't mean so, of course, that it's a, a useless or stupid division. I mean, I, I think the Lady Lovelace did a great deal, although it was invented semiotic, uh, to um, clarify things uh, in the field. But I don't think this was meant to be a uh, sort of rigid, hard and fast distinction. All of these were meant, uh, these uh, components of semiotic were ever meant to be other than interdependent. Sort of like biological species. Yeah. Well, they, you know, one can be used out the other, really. <laughs> and there is convenient ways of... Uh, I was just, uh, sorry? I was just curious if you had anything sharper than that in mind, but I see that... You don't. Well, I can. I mean, for example, I have a Montague semantics, a Montague intentional logic, because semantics exists in a certain uh, otherwise independent world, the truth valuation scheme, and these are possible worlds, or possible universes, which consists in a, a line, uh, or can, it can be represented as, and modeled as, sorry, a, a line traversing as many universes as those to which the statement refers. Uh, and um, um, completing itself and passing through one point at least in each of the universes which are relevant. And that's a Montague truth functional. Truth functional in that 
the semantics of an ordinary uh, standard predicate logic, say, will be essentially the semantics of the power set of the set of primitives and the set of more primitive right? uh, well, the power set of the power set of the power set of the power set, right, no matter. Uh, there will always be constructed the power set of. Um, semantic uh, may be taken to be um, F set of expressions, uh, uh, M model in model theoretic sense, and uh, mapping onto truth functional, which usually is TF. Um, and the uh, definition for the model in TF, semantics of the set of expressions. Uh, in this case, one doesn't inquire into why the language is used. One is looking simply at the structural features of the language, really. So, I mean, it's, you know, um, sure I have very precise notions in context, but uh, this is one of the reasons why I'm dubious of the term semantic net, because it seems to me that when the word is, is useful, it's either used as a uh, rather vague and necessarily vague classifier, or else it's used uh, in a very specific context. Mm -hmm. And um, I cannot see anything about these, well, most of these nets, which, which uh, particularly warrants the title semantic. That seems a very useful criticism to me, and worth pushing just a little bit in our discussion of the comparisons in the there is a tendency, once a word like that is adopted about a procedure, yeah. to imply a whole set of connotations and meanings about it that aren't necessarily there. And the people who have originally picked that word for it may not have really meant to oh, I'm sure carry that whole thing. I'm sure they didn't. And uh, I'm sure they I'm didn't. I'm not so sure they didn't. And uh, the, uh, well, all right, <laughs> uh, you'd better, as somebody in AI, Paul, tell me what's the difference between an associative net and a semantic net. Well, none at all. I'm not sure I make any assumptions about that. Well, I mean, you're in comp in, in, uh, in uh, procedural terms, there's no difference at all. I wouldn't have thought so. No. But I mean, in that case, you know, this is my objection. Yeah. I mean, that's just, uh, yeah, no, it's a well taken. Yes. Yeah. Have you reviewed uh, the list? Mm. And and now I have got some other items here to come. Experts exist in different universes each. Uh, comments you made, I wanted to further am amplify. And uh, the on, on the significance of that? And the on the significance of it, sure and uh, knowledge and belief. That's your last point, I think. Okay. Is that...? Well, I've got, I've got those noted down. I mean, I can do what you like. What is I got them noted down now, and I uh, hope I've noted them correctly. You know, formulated a kind of list of stoppings correctly, so think about them. Well, feel free to embellish it and... Sure, oh yes, uh, it'll probably get embellished as it goes on. The concepts that come out of AI uh, that are similar to associative nets that you find useful in terms of thinking about implementations uh, or theoretical developments of conversations. <coughs> it would be very difficult to say no. <coughs> Because, I mean, does a, does a thing like a, an algorithm or program, for example, come out of AI, it's obvious to use an AI, or does it come from Markov, who first wrote about them in, in a mathematical way, or is it something used during, or whatever? Uh, 
in fact, was there in language, and both algorithm and algorithm were there long before either of them, but rather rigorous definitions were given by Markov. I don't mean the Markov of Markov chains, I mean the other mathematician in Russia called Markov, who wrote the canonical work in this field, I think, uh, the theory of algorithms in English translation. And I can't read the Russian. <laughs> It has to be an English translation. Uh, <coughs> a very brilliant book indeed, but uh, I mean, is that part of AI? Now, I just don't know. Of course it is that. No, these notions were enormously influential, enormously useful. I feel so there are lots of notions actually that are enormously useful that have emerged at later dates and different stages. And um, I had... Um, I certainly hesitate to say of any you know, sensible subject area that, that nothing useful came out of it, and, or came, came through this field out of it, or came to, to our heads out of it. I think it would be quite arrogant and stupid. But um, it's very difficult to identify what exactly belongs to AI. I certainly wouldn't dream of performing a serious experiment of any sort, or even <coughs> said you have any serious work procedure in the moment. based upon the uh, AI models. Other people do. Uh, I wouldn't be like... Uh, is it fair to say there isn't AI model? Oh, yes, is there are AI fair? models. For example, oh, there is a theory of learning due to Atkinson and Schifrin, which deals with a uh, type of short-term and long-term storage and how things get there and get out of it. Um, it has a grain of truth in it. Um, it's unduly complicated, it was, well I shouldn't say it's primarily motivated by the availability of uh, um, a rather too slow CAI system which they could use for experiment. Um, so this monster was employed to carry out the enormous experiments which people were presented with various utterances and had bits and whatnot in people, and uh, were carefully timed, carefully timed, and how uh, recorded how they react. And, uh, data was subject to horrendous statistical analysis. But uh, I mean, it, it, you know, uh, there is a good deal of truth in the Atkinson Schiffrin theory. I certainly believe it myself. Uh, I've, um, <coughs> so it's, uh, <coughs> I think anybody studying psychology should um, be aware of that theory, probably, and most of them are. It's a, it is a prerequisite for better courses in psychology, or prerequisite for it is one component of the better course in psychology. Um, it's certainly more realistic than many statistical learning models, of course. Uh, presumably it's a piece of AI. Uh, another piece of AI is the notion of expert system, which is due to Oliver Selfridge, in fact, I think. Mm -hmm. Oliver Selfridge, the guy I mentioned yesterday, yeah. who has been developed by Steele and people of this kind a great deal. And uh, it's been developed by the people concerned with actor-like languages, which I really, really hate the difference as far as I can see between the an actor and an expert in accepting the, the, in an expert system, uh, there is an ordinance of specializing the actors in some way. Uh, maybe more to than that, but I don't think there's very much more. An act tends to be uh, a collection of procedures and a collection of descriptions and terms and programs, and uh, the, um, so is an expert. Uh, the design of actor languages, I guess, was a very, which, which I think started with the, with the language called actor, did it not? I think that was the first one. So it was called actor, I suppose. I mean, the computer language, not the proper language. Yes. I'm actually glad you brought up actor languages because 
much of the virtue that you have ascribed to conversation theory, one hopes at some point will be available throughout the languages themselves. I wonder about that because of Ashby's definition. Hmm? I wonder about that because of Ashby's definition. Uh, I would hope so too. They certainly are available actually to actors which are implemented in such a way that they form a population of machines rather than just one machine of which they are, albeit clever, specialized bits. Uh, in that sense, yes. The population paradigm is a bit different to the actor or expert paradigm. Mm -hmm. and so far, <coughs> as far as I can see, as the unless a different kind of counting is done. Um, a different kind of counting is done. In which case you conceive a machine acting um, in a mechanical sense. Could you could you describe a bit what this different kind of counting would look like? Yes, and this is why I think we're going to have to go back to that stuff up that's, there because in fine. fact it's all about that stuff. And um, I mean, in fact, the uh, ways of counting over the paces of syntheses in a simplical complex. Well, I'm all in favor of yeah. going back to the board. Yeah. Well, I mean, I th I'm asked me not to do so, and I, I, well, I, I must, I prefer to agree. I, I prefer to do it this way, but I think we shall have to more easily go back to that than to read Reutel. <laughs> Uh, and, um, no, once again, I would prefer you to start from this list and do general. Well, this is the list. No that is the list. There's no point in going back to a diagram and pick up a discussion that we didn't know where we were. That is the list. Yeah, well, why don't you start again? I mean, you have a blank board there and some more. Well, because it takes uh, one hell of a lot of, of, um, of trouble to do it and correct mistakes on some of the pages. But who wish me to? Well, I, do, do, I mean, do, I'm prepared to repeat well, the same thing. Yeah, I do. Yeah. I just think a cleaner <coughs> Well, it, it's not going to be a clean explanation. I've got a list here of one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven things, about approximately ten or eleven things, uh, all of which are touched on there. And I can see no particular order in which they ought to be approached. Um, we're ending up, in fact, with the first one, I guess, because it is perhaps the most important thing, the notion that there is a duel between L sub P and, uh, in L sub P, between the mesh and the unfoldment class, or unfoldment of the mesh, or meshes. And uh, to make sense of that, we need the notion of a concept specification, which hasn't yet been specified. Uh, we need uh, a discussion of coherence, distinction, and process, uh, which is required. Uh, we need the notion of um, dimension of event relations, or type of counting. Um, we need some discussion of truth values, it kind of goes along with that. And uh, after that, perhaps, a bit more chat about, or discussion about semantic notes. The only one I've reordered so far is one of them. And um, experts in many universes is simply the fact that <coughs> an expert system, if you have an expert system, really, in which each expert has a proper universe of its own, though it may, several experts may act on only one universe, and some may act upon several, I presume. Because I'm the expert amongst the working who can go to contain the rules that contain in that possible universe of this court, and to contain its syntax structure, at least, uh, even if not its semantic. The universes differ in the, the rules they obey and expressions in them can obey and actions in them can obey as well as in the objects or materials or whatever from which they're composed. And as to knowledge and belief, well, I guess in order to do that, 
uh, we're addressing very much uh, something dear to AI, but for that purpose we've got to say why L sub P is a language of the kind it is, is an interpretation of conversation theory amongst other things, and uh, that requires a, at least a run through of the notion of the nine conversation theory. So, I mean, I'm sorry, it's, it's more or less the same kind of thing with some extension of it, and I don't see any great point in in starting at a different end. So why don't you just go ahead? As, as is comfortable. <laughs> no, mind. I mean, it's, uh, uh, you know, I'm quite prepared to, uh, to do it any way you like, and I'm not fussy about this at all, so. Well, you're not either, <laughs> So, um, I just don't like having to rewrite things unless in doing so something's terrified, and I'd rather rewrite it than <coughs> because I, I, it's, um, what I do need, however, preliminary, is a copy of that paper. Any of the papers with the production schemes in them. Um, which paper is this? Well, any of them with the production schemes would do. All I want to look at are the production the schemes. Uh, no. Um. What it meant to have. Uh, a sharing of concepts and an agreement ever understanding in that detail or not before? I think rather likely, but I think that, would you agree that that's worth going over again? Yes. Going over again, yes. Yeah. I think we have only really referred to it and not fully dealt with it here. I think so, until last time. Until last time, certainly. Right. And uh, that illusion is quite unnecessary. I mean, quite, sorry, quite insufficient. Probably not unnecessary. It's quite insufficient. It's a key notion. And I think it's drawn out already, but we can draw this one out again. A uh, hard-valued event in the psychological or social sciences, or I think in cybernetics generally, is an event that takes place in something not yet defined called language. Okay. And we'll call that language L. Now, it used to be my general habit to divide L into levels, like L0, super zero, L super one. So I'm going to put maybe L super zero, L super one, dot, 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 dot. This stratification is, of course, inessential to the language. <coughs> the language is like a natural language. You can use it either as an L Super one, a kind of metal language over an L super zero. It may be convenient to make a distinction, or may not then. I refer <coughs> in literature often years concept. Which it is in the literature find it cropping up ever ever since uh, Saul Amaral and Saul Gorn, and uh, Saul Gorn's discussion of uh, what he called uh, unstratified and stratified control, where unstratified control was essentially that natural linguistic like, and uh, control at various levels or strata of language was this type, and he made very big differences in these red. I never intended, however, I will put in here, not at any point, intended to be any 
other than conveniently stratified. Addressing other than conveniently stratified scheme, which is important because so far as real languages, by which I mean real natural languages, as it were, verbal or not, uh, are unstratified, uh, are, unstratified uh, are unstratified, stratified, uh, specifically unstratified. However, oh, well, there's no harm whatever in, I think, if you find it convenient for one purpose or another, and state the purpose, to consider these uh, strata to exist. Now, if you're going to draw something rather like this strata is considered, uh, and uh, so that's why I bring that in at all, and it can be deceiving otherwise if one draws sort of stratified looking diagrams which aren't really stratified. And since you have in the past, and I'm still do occasionally refer to sort of levels of a language as L1 being a meta-language for talking about L0 and so forth. Right. What was the, uh, the continuation of the first line where it says, in literature, I don't see their language? In literature often you the concept. Okay. Not at any point is this thing, wiggly, 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 to make it clearer that stratification intended to be any other than conveniently stratified scheme insofar as real languages are uh, specifically unstratified. I know you can conveniently make these this break up very often if it's convenient with the purposes of exposition. Fine. In, in general, it's very dubious. Now, uh, we have a language, <coughs> a thing called a pressure language. I'm going to call it L sub P. Uh, sub P is, stands for proto or primitive. Uh, often called uh, Glanville Pedretti, for example, Pedretti who wrote that very nice book on language there, Glanville who Heinz was external examiner to. Uh, yeah, it's, uh, you have a copy there on your desk. Uh, a proto-logic, and I, I and I, I'm prone, uh, I think it, I, I think I, I, I do agree, but it depends on usage. I mean, as for example, if as the Gaginometi school do. Nemeti and Drake results. probably in the wrong alphabetic order, I'm sorry for him. Uh, where L is equal to this model here. Um, Some people would call it the logic. Montague, for example, called it a logic, this kind of thing. 
uh, well, isn't restricted to model in one world. In fact, we will call that classic model. Mi F passive expression F J. <coughs> okay. And uh, Montague intentional logic, for example, is logic like that. Uh, and they 